pleased to have with us uh, as speaker, Professor David Sirovich. Professor Sirovich is no stranger to Singapore. In fact, uh, he was here un until very recently in Singapore for four to five years uh, as the executive director of the Institute for High Performance Computing and subsequently as the executive director of Science and Engineering Research Council, both of uh, the uh, ASTAR, the uh, Agency for Science and Technology Research. And uh, I think many of you will be uh, quite familiar with, with ASTAR. Uh, Professor Sirovich is currently the Joseph Begut No uh, Professor of Engineering and Applied Science at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. He's also the director of the Penn Institute for Computational Science. Uh, and prior to this, he was, well, he was at ASTAR, the uh, director of the Institute for High Performance Computing, and then before that, he was professor at Yeshiva University, and before that, he was at Princeton University, as professor of aerospace and mechanical engineering, as well as holding a joint appointment also uh, in applied mathematics, applied mathematics and computational mathematics. Yeah, right. He is, Professor Sirovich is a distinguished scientist and uh, only in 2013 he won the Material, Materials Research Society Prize in Material Theory, Materials Theory. And only last week, in fact only a few days ago, we heard over lunch that he had just been appointed, elected to the, as a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So we are very pleased that he's able to join us uh, today uh, here. And first of all, as, a, uh, as an invited speaker at the workshop uh, on high performance computing that is uh, currently taking place at the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and also for uh, agreeing to give a public lecture this evening. And the title is Bubbles, Foams, Grains, Metals, Curvature Flow, in cellular materials. Please welcome Professor Sirovich. So, uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, what I've tried to do in preparing the slides tonight is to um, address some of the general issues associated with a certain class of materials. And I'm trying to do it in a way which is accessible to a wide range of people. So if you have any questions, I'd suggest you ask me during the talk. And please feel free to interrupt me. And I'll be happy to answer them as I go. But it's just a question of uh, making sure you understand as we go along. So what I'll try to do is give you a general introduction, and then I'll show you some of how this basic questions in material science leads to some really interesting issues in mathematics and in computational science. So I hope you uh, find what I'm going to speak about interesting today. Okay, so actually before I start, let me mention that the work I'm going to be talking about is work done with a, with a postdoc of mine, uh, Manuel Lazar and uh, Bob McPherson. Uh, Lazar is currently a postdoc with me at the University of Pennsylvania. Bob McPherson is a topologist at the Institute for Advanced Study in, in, in Princeton. Um, it's interesting, my connection with Bob McPherson, who really does pure mathematics, was just came about as an accident. And in fact, somebody told him there's good geometry problems in material science, so he decided he would sit in one of my classes. And our collaboration came out from that. Um, he was one of my best students. <laughs> Okay, so let's start in the following way. You all recognize this. If you've ever, ta if you've ever taken one of these bubble wands and stuck it in and blow a bubble, you end up with something like this. 
And this is a liquid film on the outside here. And inside that film is made of water. Inside that water, there's usually some polymers and surfactant that keeps it from popping so easily. And if you look at it, the outside of the bubble is a thin liquid film. The inside is just air. It's a gas. So I've got gas on the outside, gas, gas on the outside, gas on the inside, and this thin liquid film around here. And it turns out that the pressure of the gas on the inside and the pressure of the gas on the outside are different. And why are they different? They're different because, sorry, I need my hands for this. By the way, can you hear me without the microphone? Is it okay? Good, because I need my hands. It's hard for me to talk without using my hands. So you have a bubble, and here's a liquid film around it like this. And the bubble is trying to shrink, it's trying to pull in, and so it's squeezing together the gas that's on the inside. And so the gas on the inside is under a high pressure, and the pressure that it's under depends on the surface tension, which I call gamma, the surface tension of the liquid, and it also depends on the size of the bubble. So the difference in pressure between the inside and the outside is just the proportional to the surface tension divided by the radius of the bubble, or in other words, is just proportional to the surface tension times the curvature. So the curvature of a sphere is just 2 divided by the radius. Okay? And that's going to be important because a lot of what we're talking about is going to be the radius of curvature of the object. Okay? So we call that radius of curvature H, and I'll talk more about that later on. Okay, now if I wait over time, you all know what happens to a bubble if you wait for a long time. Well, one thing that happens, there's two things that can happen. One is that the bubble shrinks. And if you have a balloon, imagine you blow up a balloon, and the balloon's under a very high pressure on the inside, because that's how much I blew into it. And over time, your balloon, balloon starts to shrivel. And that's because the gas that's on the inside of the balloon diffuses through that plastic layer, you know, the actual balloon, to the outside. So the amount of gas on the inside decreases. Same thing in a bubble. The high pressure gas on the inside diffuses out through this liquid membrane, starts to and the, it starts to shrink. And so over time, what you'll see is that the bubble shrinks. And how fast it shrinks is just proportional to the difference in pressure, and therefore is proportional to, or inversely proportional to the size of the bubble. So as the bubble gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it shrinks faster and faster and faster. So the kinetics, how fast the bubble changes shape, size, is related to how big it is. So that's the connection between the kinetics and the geometry of the bubble. Okay? Very simple case. You probably all learned about this a long, long time ago. Okay, now let's make it a little bit more interesting. If I take these bubbles and I put them together to make a foam, they're now in a network. Now, if I ask the question, what's the curvature of the bubble? What's the radius of curvature? Well, if I look at this one, this bubble's a different size than, say, some other bubble here. Here's a big bubble. Here's a small bubble. So they all have different radii, and they all have different curvatures, and so they all shrink at different rates. And to really understand how fast this bubble shrinks, or that bubble shrinks, I need to know how those bubbles are connected. Because if I look very closely here, I can see that this part here, sorry, it's easier for me to point here. This part's curved like this, so the center curvature is inside that bubble. But if I look at some other bubbles, like right here, if I look at this big bubble here, this is curved this way. And since it's curved this way, this bubble is going to move this way thin liquid layer is going to move in that direction. It's going to move towards its center of curvature. So this, this liquid film will grow this way, so this bubble will shrink, that bubble will grow. 
This one will shrink because the curvature's inside. And this one will grow because this one next to it is shrinking. So how fast something grows and how fast something shrink depends on the details of the geometry, how things are connected. So the network problem, you know, these kinds of networks are much more complicated than looking at an individual bubble. But if you've all, if you've ever looked at a foam over time, you know that the average size of the bubbles are going to increase in time. Foams coarsen over time, so the average bubble size goes up. So we want to try to understand how these structures evolve. Okay? Okay. Now let's do something different. Here is my computer. And the skin of the computer is made out of a metal. In fact, it's aluminum. And if I was going to look in a microscope at the structure of the metal, I would see something that looks like this. And so these are individual domains that we call grains. And you can see these grain structures are very similar to the bubble structures that we saw a minute ago. And so this is an aluminum alloy, and you see all these different grains. And if I look at different materials, if I look at, say, this is a stainless steel, this is a ceramic, a tin oxide ceramic, these kinds of domain structures or cellular structures or, or foam-like structures are basically the kinds of things that you see in almost any material that's crystalline. So what's going on here? So let me show you a little bit more detail. So here's, a, one of the, here's an example of one of those kinds of structures. We call them microstructures. And if this is one grain, this is another grain. We call this whole thing this ensemble. We call it a polycrystalline material. And one grain is separated from another grain by a grain boundary. So if I look at a little region like that, and I zoom in and look at it on an atomic scale, I might see the atoms arranged something like this. And if I color them, I can see that all of these atoms here are arranged the same way here as they are there, there. But in each of those regions, the crystal is turned a slightly different angle. Okay? And a region such as this, where all the atoms are arranged in the same crystal in the same orientation, those are all the atoms in one grain. And I have a grain boundary, which is an interface that separates two crystals, which are exactly the same, but they're just twisted a little different relative to each other. OK? So in a metal, or in a ceramic, or in some polymers, what I end up with is an arrangement where all the grains have exactly the same crystal structure but they're all put together in little patches or little grains like this, and that's how they're actually connected together, okay? So it looks very much like the bubbles, but remember in the bubble case, we had a gas on the inside and a liquid film on the outside. Here we have a crystal on the inside, and this plane we call the grain boundary, is just the place, the plane across which the orientation changes. OK? So you're all with me? OK, good. So let's move on. So how does a grain boundary move? So if this is one grain, that's another grain, these gray atoms here are those atoms that can't decide whether they're red or blue. They don't know where, which one they're really attached to. 
And this is the region where the structure is a little messed up. It's not perfect crystal like this or perfect crystal like that. And I have a grain boundary which is curved. And that grain boundary is curved just like a wall and a, and a foam was curved. And the curvature is just two, time, two divided by the radius. That's the radius of curvature. And I can think about it just like I thought about it in a liquid, in this case of a foam or a bubble. I can think about it as if there was a pressure which goes like the surface tension times the radius times the curvature. Okay? And if the grain boundary moves with, say, some mobility m, I can write down that the velocity in which a grain boundary moves it just goes like the mobility times that pressure. And the grain boundary always moves in the direction normal to itself. So that's what that n represents. The velocity is proportional to the curvature and the surface tension. And it moves towards its center of curvature. Okay, And this is just like in the bubbles. In the bubbles, we had a case where the velocity, again, was just proportional to the curvature. Okay, so now I want to ask how does this whole polycrystalline arrangement, how does it evolve over time? Or how does my foam coarsen over time? And it turns out that it's closely related to a mathematical concept known as curvature flow. And so we'll talk a little bit about curvature. Okay, so actually, before I go too far, let me show you a few movies. I think watching a few movies is a better way of getting a feeling of what happens than, you know, I could sit here and talk for another 30 minutes, but a movie will help. So let's focus first on the movie on your left. Oops. So now, is that moving? Yeah, it's moving slowly. If I watch, is that moving? Mm. I want a second. says it's moving. Oh yeah, there it goes. So if you watch, if you spend a little time looking at that, it doesn't project that well, but you see that the small grains tend to shrink. The big grains tend to grow. And on average, the average grain size increases with time. Okay. And if I let this go for a sufficiently long time, I'd end up with one or two grains left. OK. The movie's not, uh, the projector's not doing a very good job showing it. But so there's two things that are happening here. One is that the grain boundaries are just migrating towards their center of curvature. The second thing that's happening is the arrangements of the bubbles, the number of sides they have, is changing in time. Okay? So the topology is changing and the geometry is changing. Now this case is a foam. And if you watch the foam, you see a lot of the same things happening. The small bubbles are disappearing. The large bubbles are growing. And what, as a result, you end up with a structure which is very similar to this one. But one of the things you notice here is that one of the differences between the two is you see this structure is shaking as it grows. right? 
Now, why does the structure shake? Why does a foam shake in a metal knot? So, as it happens, in a bubble, when a bubble shrinks and disappears, all, and one bubble completely disappears, all of the edges have to rearrange because I have to have constant pressure inside each bubble. And each bubble pushes on the bubble next to it. So when one bubble disappears, everything else has to adjust. And so although these two things have to lead to very similar structure, there's a slightly different kind of dynamics there. And just to show you, this is an experimental picture that by one of my colleagues, uh, Adam Roth and Doug Dorian. I actually had to explain to Doug how he's named after a fruit. But uh, I don't think he knew that before. But so this is actually an experimental observation of some bubbles. And you can see every time a bubble disappears, there's a little bit of shaking going on. So that kind of shaking that's going on is real characteristic of foam. But in a metal, I don't have that happening. So it's, it's one of the differences between those two. OK. This goes on for another minute. <laughs> I think it's a lot of fun to watch these things. So the main thing I, you should know is the small ones disappear, big ones tend to grow, and the average tends to grow. It gets coarser. OK. Let's do some of the mathematics. This, this is where it gets fun. <coughs> well, actually, I think those other pictures are fun, too. But. OK, so imagine I take an arbitrary curve, a closed curve. Think about this as a, somebody who's drawing a bubble after they had a little bit too much to drink. OK, so we want to see how this bubble is going to evolve in time, this very funny bubble. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, like we said before, the velocity is proportional to the curvature. And if the velocity is proportional to the curvature, we have a thing which is called curvature flow. That means velocity proportional to curvature. So if I take any object like this, any closed object here, it's, and I'm going to assume it's a smooth closed curve, and S measures just some distance around the curve. And so if gamma is the shape, I can look to see how the sh shape changes as I go along the curve. And at any point, I can look at the tangent to the curve. And one of the interesting things, if I look at this tangent vector, sorry, I'll use my hand, this tangent vector rotates around like this as I go around. And the curvature is just the variation of that tangent as you go around the curve. Okay? A little confusing. I'll try to make that clear in a minute. So, but the point is this curvature is the variation of the tangent to the curve as you go around the curve. Okay? And so now if I look at any point on the curve and I say the velocity is proportional to the curvature, here at the center of the curvature, is on the inside, so this part of the curve moves in. Here, the curvature is like this, so the center of curvature is out here, so this part moves out like that. And so this whole thing is going to evolve um, in the following way. So if I look at this curve, and I can define the normal to the curve, we find that the, the velocity or the rate of change of the shape of that curve goes like the mobility times the surface tension times the curvature and always in the direction normal to itself. So the surface always moves normal to itself and the magnitude and direction depend on that curvature. Okay? So let's do something interesting with this. So what can we say generally about this? Well, if the velocity of a curve is proportional to its curvature, there's a nice theorem from 1986 that says when we have curvature flow, any convex curve will remain convex and it will shrink to a point 
just like that. Okay? So any closed curve that's convex will always remain convex. So it's concave now, but now it's convex. And once it's convex, it stays convex. Okay, so that was 1986. A year later, Grayson showed that under curvature flow, any curve that's not convex becomes convex. And since it's convex, it must shrink to a point. So any closed curve that's evolving under curvature flow eventually shrinks as a point. Not two points, not three points, not seven points. It always will shrink and disappear at a point. Okay? So those are two nice theorems from the 80s. And you see that it always shrinks to one point, so there's only one singularity. At one point it disappears. Okay, now, what else can I say? Well, if I want to look at the area enclosed inside that curve, all I have to do is integrate the curvature around that object and the rate of change of the area inside is just proportional to the velocity integrated around that, curve, around that profile. And if I integrate it around there, I get something like this. So I say the rate of change of the area with respect to time is just the velocity integrated around the whole shape. But the velocity is just this d gamma dt. Those are the normal direction. Well, one of the interesting things you have is that if you take any curve, one thing I know about the curvature is if I go all the way around any closed object, the tangent vector has to go through 2 pi, right? If I go around a curve and say look at the normal or I look at the tangent, if I go all the way around that curve, whatever its shape, it's going to go around one time. Okay, it's obvious for a circle, right? If I look at the normal, as I go all the way around, the normal goes around one time. Even if it's a complicated curve, it's going to go around once. And so that's always going to integrate to 2 pi. And so this result is a very general result. And the cool thing is, it says that all shapes of a given size shrink at exactly the same rate. And what's the rate? It's just the mobility times the surface tension times 2 pi. So any closed curve is going to shrink at the same rate. That's kind of a surprising result. OK. So those, that's an individual bubble or an individual grain. Now let's switch and think about the grains or the bubbles inside the network. Okay? So to think about that, what we're going to do is say, well, those bubbles, the liquid films meet at a point in two dimensions. They, so three grain boundaries or three liquid layers, three liquid films meet at a point. And so at what angle do they meet? Well, it turns out to be 120 degrees. And there's a theorem that goes back to Fermat a few years ago, uh, which says if I specify any point, A, B, and C, and I have from there that all those films meet at a point, X, then the angle between those in equilibrium, or the angle between is such that the total length of all those lines is a minimum, corresponds to a case where the, all the angles are 120 degrees. So if I tell you three points, A, B, and C, tell them I have three lines going from there to the central point, X, the position of this point will adjust until all the angles are 120 degrees. And it's kind of cool, because this is, goes back, this is uh, 300 years old. Okay, so if I look at any foam, or in any gray, in any polycrystalline material, if I look very closely, 
all these angles are going to be 120 degrees. Now, one of the interesting things about that is if I have an object here, for example, that has five sides, the only way I can have a five-sided object meet at 120 degrees is if some of these domain walls or these liquid layers are curved such that the curvature, center curvature is on the inside. Okay, keep that in mind because that's, that's a cool little point. So what happens if they don't meet at 120 degrees? Well, so let's think about it like this. So we, we, we said that in curvature flow, the velocity is proportional to curvature. At these corners, the curvature is infinite. And if the curvature is infinite, and you're at the wrong angle, the angle, since the velocity is proportional to curvature, that angle readjusts with infinite velocity, if velocity is proportional to curvature, and therefore, we can think about these angle conditions as a boundary condition. That is, all those angles always will meet at 120 degrees, no matter what I do. Because if I get it wrong, it'll fix itself with infinite speed. Okay? <coughs> okay. So, so, this brings us to up to 1950, or actually 1952. So we recall that the rate of change in the area of any closed object goes like 2 pi times the mobility times the curvature. Okay? Now, the famous mathematician from the middle of the uh, 20th century, John von Neumann, was listening to a talk given by a metallurgist, um, Cyril Stanley Smith, and after the talk, he raised his hand and he said to me, there's something wrong here. And what he said was that, well, really what's going on is the area inside here it's going to shrink according to the curvature, just like we said, that the velocity is proportional to the curvature. But if you look, some of that curvature is all sucked up into these little vertexes where three grain boundaries meet, where three of these walls meet. And so what he said is that, well, if I go along these walls, remember the curvature is just the, di is just the derivative of the tangent. So if I go around one of these curves here and I keep going, it changes abruptly, point like that. So you have a finite amount of curvature, which is all contained in those vertices. And in fact, he said that the rate of change of the area should go like m gamma times 2 pi minus the amount that's of the curvature that's stuck in these corners. Okay. So now, if all the angles, if all the angles here are 120 degrees, this jump here must be 60 degrees, or pi over 3. So what he then said is that, well, it should go like 2 pi times the number of corners times 60 degrees, or pi over 3, which in the end turns out, if you just take the two pies that throw take this, this pi over three and take it on the outside, that says that the rate of change of the area with respect to time is equal to some constant times the number of sides minus six. And I have to say, this is one of the most beautiful relations I know because we start by doing all this kinetics, we start by doing all this geometry, and you end up with a result that's purely topology. It only depends on the number of sides. It doesn't depend on the shape. It doesn't depend on how big it is. It doesn't depend on whether it's curved like this or curved like this. It doesn't matter. It just goes proportional to the number of sides minus six. 
So any object, say a seven-sided or an eight-sided grain will always grow. A five-sided or a four-sided grain will always shrink. And the fewer the sides it has, the faster it shrinks. So I think it's really a beautiful result. And like I was telling you, von Neumann just was watching this talk and he said, it seems to me, and he gave this result. Um, you know, John von Neumann was not particularly intuitive. He just looked at the problem and solved it. He did, and he often didn't do it the easy way. Um, so this was actually generalized later on by a guy named Bill Mullins uh, a few years later. Okay, now, a few comments about this relation. Besides being one of the most beautiful relations in material science, I think, it's purely topological. It doesn't depend on grain shape. Grains with, with number of sides greater than six grow, less than six sides shrink. And hexagonal grains are, in principle, stable. And if you look at all the theory of foams, and you look at all the theory of grain growth, chain of grain size, it all comes down to this beautiful result. But we have one little problem. This is all in two dimensions. And most of us live in a three-dimensional world. So we do care about how this works in three dimensions as well. So topology in, topology in two dimensions is really easy. In three dimensions, it is difficult. So Cyril Stanley Smith, who was the guy who was giving the talk that uh, von Neumann was listening to, said, it is greatly to be hoped that he, meaning von Neumann, or some other mathematician will be able to do similar relationship relations in three dimensions. Well, 50 years and about 1,000 papers later, it, it still wasn't solved. So I was working with my friend uh, who came to my class, uh, Bob McPherson. And Bob called me up one day. He said, you know, I got an idea about that problem you said that can't be solved. So what I'm going to do now is show you how this works in three dimensions. And uh, I, I actually think it's beautiful as well and shows that von Neumann's result is actually just a special case. Okay, and I'm not going to do the whole derivation, I'm just going to give it to you. So, what makes three dimensions so hard? Well, in three dimensions, I don't have one curvature, I have two curvatures. So if I look at this brown surface here, it's curved this way, it's curved that way. And so, in fact, I've got two curvatures. I got this red dotted line here, and I got that red dotted line there. And so, the two curvatures I can talk about are the sum of those two curvatures, and we call that the mean curvature. Or we can look at the product of those two curvatures. We call that the Gauss curvature. Okay. And the way we actually solved this in two dimensions was using something called the Gauss-Bonnet relation. I'm not going to go through it, but the point is, it happens to apply to the Gauss curvature, not to the mean curvature. In two dimensions, the Gauss curvature and the mean curvature are the same thing. But there's actually more to it than just that. Okay, so let me go through and show you a few more things that happen in three dimensions, and then I'll jump and give you the answer. So there's another theorem from the 1980s that says, for all dimensions greater than or equal to two under mean curvature flow, a convex compact surface will remain convex and shrink to a point. Okay, I showed you that result in two dimensions. Uh, Uskin demonstrated that it actually applies in all dimensions, which is kind of cool, greater than, two, greater than or equal to two. But the problem is the theorem, the other theorem that I told you about that says that non-convex objects become convex, it doesn't work in three dimensions. And in fact, a non-convex surface can break into many smaller other surfaces. So if I start with a surface that's shaped like, uh, like a dumbbell like this, if I let it evolve under curvature flow, 
you see the first thing that happens is it breaks into two objects. Each one becomes convex and shrinks away to point. So instead of, instead of shrinking away as two, one point, it's now breaking into two objects and shrinks as two points. And there's nothing general about that. I could, if I put in something which is really complex, it could fall apart in seven points. So it can break up. So life's much more complicated in three dimensions than in two dimensions. <laughs> OK. So now let me just show you a simulation in three dimensions. So we're, this, is, this is curvature flow, velocity proportional to curvature. So this is from a three-dimensional simulation. I can show it to you starting with a million grains, but they're too small to see. But if I just watch this, it looks very similar to what we saw in two dimensions. But it's not exactly the case because if you watch, well, let's see if I can find one. You never find these things when I look for them. You have cases where new grains seem to be forming. Oh, darn it. You never find them when I'm looking for it. Here, let me show it to you in two dimensions. It should be a cube or rectangular form. Excuse me? I say the, it should be a cube or rectangular form. This is a foam. Imagine you have an infinite foam, and I put this in a periodic box. And then I'm just looking at the surfaces. That's what I'm looking at, just the surfaces of this three-dimensional foam. So inside, you've got lots of little bubbles. And you're just looking at the, the three surfaces on a cube. Uh, let's see. Oh, OK, here, let me show you another picture. It all goes so fast. I love that movie. Okay, here's another picture of exactly the same thing, but this is a cross section of three dimensions. Now, if you look carefully, it's actually different than what you saw in two dimensions, because every once in a while you'll see. Uh, you'll see new, op, new grains seem to form in some places, and then you see grains pinching off in other places. I mean, it goes so fast, I know if I stare at it for enough time, like that's something, uh, let me find one. So here, there one, there's one that just appeared and starting to grow. The reason it's growing is even though I'm looking at this two-dimensional section, I've got a grain that's growing, it's really big and growing from back here, and it hits the viewing surface from this side, and it looks like a new grain starting to grow out of nothing. But it's not really what's happening. It's really, in fact, two dimensions and a cross-section of three dimensions are very different animals. OK. So let me give you the result in three dimensions, and then I'll try to explain it to you. So, so Bob and I were working on this problem for a while, and we came up with the following relation. So in, now in three dimensions, instead of looking at the area, the change in the area with respect to time, I'm looking at the change of volume with respect to time. And so if I take the curvature and I integrate it over the entire surface of a three-dimensional grain, I have the following result. dv dt, the change in volume with respect to time, is the mobility times the surface tension times this quantity here, which is the size of the grain. I'll define that for you in a minute. Minus 1 sixth of this EI summed over the grain. So EI is the edges, is the length of the edges here. So if I sum over all the lengths of all the edges going around this grain, or just an experimental image, if I sum over all of those here, and I subtract that from this grain size, L, I have an exact relationship for how the volume changes with time. So the real trick in understanding this is understanding what this mean width parameter is. And what I'm going to try to convince you of is your teachers in elementary school did you a misservice, a disservice because they should have told you about this, and for some reason they didn't do it. OK, so let me tell you what that is. It's a very fundamental parameter. OK, so let me just, I'll tell you about this in just a minute. 
But so, so like the two-dimensional relation, which says the area, the change of area with respect to time, is the number is the number of sides minus six. That relation was an exact relationship. This one in three dimensions is also exact. Okay, next thing. Unlike two dimensions, where all it depended on was the topology, the number of sides, this one depends also on some length. So it matters how big it is. Okay, so it's not purely topological. But it doesn't depend on the details, it just depends on the size. Okay, now let me spend a little bit of time telling you about mean width. And mean width, I think you'll agree with me in a few minutes, is both fundamental and gorgeous. Okay, so let me ask the question the following way. If I ask you, say, what parameter do you use to describe the shape of an object in three dimensions, it's three-dimensional size, you'd probably say the volume of the object, right? If I ask you, what, ob what do you use to describe um, the surface of an object, you know, how big it is in terms of its surface, you would say just the surface area. If I take a three-dimensional object and ask you, what is the length you would use to characterize that object? You would, of course, say the mean width. Okay, so let me tell you why you should have said that. And this is actually quite beautiful. Let's imagine I've got two objects. I don't care what shape they are, as long as they're convex. So there's this concept known as additivity. And so what I'm going to do is imagine I've got two objects, D1 and D2. And I want to say, when I put them together so they intersect like that, how big is that combined object? Well, the volume of this combined object is just the volume of object 1 plus the volume of object 2 minus the volume of the part that overlaps. OK? Obvious, right? OK, let's look at the surface area. What's the surface area of this combined object? Well, it's just the surface area of this object mine plus the surface area of that object minus the surface area of this part that intersects like that. OK? Obvious, right? Well, Hadwiger showed that there is one and only one quantity. Actually, I should have called this mean width. It actually goes back to an idea from Euler. So, um, Hadwiger showed that there's one, only one measure that satisfies this addition relationship in each dimension. And so, if I say the mean width of this object plus the mean width of that object minus the mean width of that intersection, that works the same way. So, volume, surface area, mean width. They're all the same fundamental kind of quantities. Here's another one, which I think is really cool. This goes back to Steiner in 1840. Steiner showed that if I take any convex object such as this, so imagine you have a balloon. I have a balloon like this, and imagine I stick a straw in there and I blow it up like that. And so each point on the surface moves normal to the surface at a constant velocity, and I'll call that v. So what Steiner showed is, if I want to know the volume of the object at any time, it's just equal to the volume of the object at time equals 0, its initial volume, times 2 thirds the surface area of the initial shape times velocity time, so proportional to time plus 2 pi over 3 times the mean width times time squared, plus 4 thirds pi times time cubed. I find that result kind of surprising. But it's gorgeous because I can show the, vol the volume at any time is related to the four fundamental measures of the geometry of that object. The the original volume, the original surface area, the original mean width, and 
This is just 4 thirds pi times time cubed times the number of objects. So for the mathematicians of the audience, that's just the Euler characteristic. So all of these are four fundamental measures, and the mean width is just as fundamental as the volume, the surface area, and the number of objects. Okay? So I don't know why you didn't learn that in third grade, but for some reason our teachers never teach us that. Okay, so the point is, the mean width is a very natural measure of an object, but how do we calculate it? At the end of the day, we want to use it for something. Okay, so how do we calculate it in practice? Well, if I have a convex object, I'm looking around for a convex object. I don't see what. Here's one. <laughs> so here's a convex object. Now, if I take this and measure its size with a pair of calipers, and I turn the calipers all the different ways and average over all those ways to turn it, that average caliper width is the mean width. Okay? So it works fine for eggs. Sorry, it looks like a good one. Okay, if I have a polyhedron, it's actually quite simple. The mean width is just 1 over 2 pi times, for, I go across every edge, I multiply its length here times the turning angle. That's the angle if I go tangent to this surface and then going down by 90 degrees. So that would be pi over 2. So this alpha here would be pi over 2, is the turning angle. It's how much you have to turn to go from one surface to the next. So all I have to do is average, just add that up over all the edges times the turning angle across that, and it gives me an exact relation for the, um, the mean width of any polyhedron. And I can do it for a prism. So for a prism, if this is the perimeter, that's the perimeter over 2 times its length. If I have a line, the mean width is just its length. And I could take look at any object, you know, all of the you know, all of the very simple objects here. I can measure the lengths here. If I say the edge length is A, I can count how many edges I have, I can calculate the turning angles, and I can cal calculate the mean width here, goes like that. By the way, any object where you see the coefficient is an integer is an object that you can repeat it to fill space. If it's not an integer, you can't repeat it to fill space. Kind of an interesting little thing. OK, so let me get to the important point. And here's probably the question you've been waiting for, is what is the mean width of a triceratops? <laughs> well, the mean width of triceratops is really trivial. All you do is you grid up your triceratops like this. And I look at all those little edges, and I, count, and I measure the sum of the length of each edge times the turning angle across it, and I have the mean width of the triceratops. The only problem is if the triceratops opens its mouth, <laughs> then I've got to do the same. I have to mesh the inside of the triceratops as well. But the point is, you can take any shape and calculate its mean width if you just want to make put a mesh on it. Okay. Um, okay, so I have to talk about convergence. I'm just going to say one point here is just the same idea that I showed you, and don't worry about the mathematics here. The whole point I want to leave with you with this slide here is if you write it correctly, you can show that the von Neumann result in two dimensions and the von Neumann result in three dimensions works in, that same idea works in all dimensions. And I think that's kind of cool. And so the von Neumann result, which was really famous from 1952, which we didn't extend until 2007, more than 50 years later, it actually works in all dimensions. So, you know, if I want to know how bubbles evolve in seven dimensions, no problem. It works. Okay. So, 
let me end by talking a little bit about topology per se. And so if I have a closed object here, as we said before, it's always going to shrink down to a point and disappear. And the only, the only topology change you have is it shrinks to a point. If you have a network, you can get the following kinds of things. So again, in two dimensions. So if I have four grains or four bubbles, one, two, three, four, the edges can meet like that. And if these two points join together, this point hits that point, comes apart like this. So this grain and this grain didn't used to be nearest neighbors, but now they're neighbors. So that's one kind of topology change to have in a network. Another one you can have in two dimensions is if one face or one grain disappears, it, you, lo you lose one face, you lose three edges, and uh, you lose two vertices. Or you can also have a shape like this where these two points meet going to that. And those are all the topology changes you can have. And so if I watch any evolution in two dimensions, all the transitions you will see are one of those three. A grain will disappear, two grains will, or four, two grains will exchange an edge. It also makes a nice movie. And just watching the topology evolution, you can classify every single type of event in terms of those three. Okay, in three dimensions, a sphere will shrink down to a point, or two part, two things like this can pinch off. So you can just pinch off like this into multiple objects. And those are the only two topology changes you can have for a single object in three dimensions. In a network, you can have an, a face disappear, creating an edge. And this could go, those two edges come together, creates a face. I can have a tetrahedron disappear, like that. I can have a face here disappear, break this up into two pieces, similar to this one. Or I can have this banana shrink and disappear like that. And this one can go both ways. So there's five topological evolutions that you can have. And if you watch, these are now from a three-dimensional simulation. Oops. If I just watch, I can see I can see each of those, you can see all those changes that you get as this thing shrinks. Uh, this is just five grains we pulled out of the, of the, the three-dimensional simulations. You can see faces come into existence, you can see edges form, you can see faces disappear, or edges disappear. Isn't that sexy? Okay, here. I'll just show you two more. So these are all the topological changes you can possibly have in three dimensions. Now, the thing is, I know how the grain volume changes between topology changes. But what I don't really know, I don't have a theory for, is how does the topology itself change? I can simulate it because I know the physics. I know velocity is proportional to curvature integrate. I can do that. But I don't have a theory for it. So the real challenge that's left in understanding how bubbles evolve, foams evolve, or grains evolve is to understand this topology. So we have exact relations of how things change in fixed topology. But what we don't have, and we know how what topological events we can have, but I can't tell you which events are going to occur. So I have an incomplete theory. So I can 
I have a lot of tr attempts to describe this, which I think I'm not going to go through with you. But I can show, I know what can go to what, because I know there's only five possibilities. And this whole thing, I can watch it evolve. And I can write this down as a network model in the same way that you write down network models um, for um, gen in genetics or network models uh, for many different things. But we don't know how to solve them. And so to really understand this, we still have the topology problem is, is unsolved. Okay. So let me draw some final conclusions. So while mean curvature flow and idealized model for grain growth and foam evolution, while we have all that, it's simple, it captures the main <coughs> physics, and we can extend it to include all sorts of other physics. But if we really want to know how the microstructure evolves, not just on average but locally, we need to know more about the mechanism. We now have that in three dimensions until topology changes. And how to predict this topological evolution is the big unsolved problem here. So let me end with showing you a couple pictures. So this is the Red Rock Casino and Resort in Las Vegas. This is a pub in the Red Rock Casino in Las Vegas. And if you look at this part right here, Oh, by the way, why do I care about this? Because at the end of the day, what's the best example of a foam you know of? Well, for those of you who are old enough to drink, it's looking at the head of a beer. So in this casino, in this pub, on that wall is... <laughs> so this is what I mean by relevance. <laughs> so you have enough to drink. And uh, I think the I think the art is going to carry it away, but you know it's wonderful to be able to do a theory, and wonderful to show that it's exact. But you know, experiments are really good. So this is Singapore. So I found a Tiger beer as an example. For those of you old enough to drink, I suggest after this talk you do an experiment, and I'll leave you there. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Professor Sjovic, for a very interesting talk. And uh, the talk that, that uh, started with uh, what uh, many of us thought common things like bubbles and foams, and then ending up with deep connections with uh, a lot of mathematics, topology, geometry, and so, so far going back to several hundred years, uh, the time of Gauss, as a matter of fact. And, and it's very fascinating to see how uh, a lot of mathematics went into the study of materials, in fact, and how they are analyzed and, and understood through very difficult mathematics. And uh, Professor Sirovich was one of the main contributors to this uh, topic that, that he talked about today. And I believe that uh, uh, there will be some questions, so Professor Sirovich will be happy to answer some questions. Sure. Ask you, QR is a square cube. Could it be a oblong shape or rectangular shape? You, are you asking whether the same? So, uh, let me make sure I understand the question. So, if I take a, a cube or a block or a rectangular parallel pipe bed or any of those shapes, can I describe how the how the volume of those <coughs> shapes change? Yeah. Yeah, so that theory that I showed you early on where this result from Steiner, uh, let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh, oop, too far. Uh, yeah, oop, sorry. This result due to Steiner will show you how the volume changes for any object, knowing its initial size. 
or its initial shape. So I can use the same idea and apply this result that I showed you um, to, that uh, Bob McPherson and I derived. And you can use it for you know, a cube-shaped object or any shaped object. So a cube is no different than anything else. So for example, I can use it like that. And I get the mean width and I just plug that into the same formula. Or I can do it for any shape I want. So any shape that you have, as long as I know what the turning angles are, and I know how many edges it has, so I know its initial shape, I can tell you how it's going to evolve until the topology changes. And then I can simulate what happens when the topology changes and tell you what happens after the topology changes. But the actual topological change, I don't have a good theory for. So yeah, you can do any shape you want. A cube is no different than anything else. Any shape. Yeah, how do you know that the uh, object turns at which angle? How do you know? Well, because if you take any object, I know that along the edges, all the faces have to meet at 120 degrees. OK? So if I know all the faces have to meet at 120 degrees, once, you, once I know that that's true, then this expression that I showed you, I don't know if I can find it. Yes, here we go. That expression will work as long as all the edges meet at 100, as all the faces meet at 120 degrees. If I have that, then everything else is completely described by that expression. It doesn't depend on the details of the shape as long as all faces meet at 120 degrees. Or any other angle, but if it's any other angle, I've got to recompute all the numbers that go in there. OK, I'm not sure I answered your question. It sounds like a, the object is a liquid form, in a liquid form. In, it could be in this foam, in any grain, in, any bubble inside of a foam or any grain inside of a polycrystalline material, whether it's a metal or a ceramic. The same theory works for all of those. It's the same physics. It's velocity proportional to curvature, and then this is the consequence. So if you had a two-dimensional network with only hexagons, yes. that would be stable. If you have a two-dimensional network made all of hexagons, it would just, it, if, it, if the hexagons were not with straight edges, they would evolve until the edges are straight, and then they would stop. It would stop evolving. But if you start at random, you will never get to a, an array of hexagons. It will always evolve, and that will never form. Well, it's a measure zero. Is it is there in three dimensions a similar stable? Excellent question. So we saw that in two dimensions, there is, if you put an array of hexagons, it will be stable. It, so the question is, is there a shape or a set of shapes in three dimensions for which it's stable? And the answer is no, which I think is not intuitive, but seems to be true. I don't actually don't have a proof of that. So the case is it should work for any, any kind of materials where the surface tension is a constant. So it works for bubbles because I have a thin liquid film. If it's very thin liquid film, all the surface tensions are the same. It works. If you, if you have grain, you know, polycrystalline materials, metals, ceramics, crystalline polymers, it should work in exactly the same way, assuming everything's isotropic. Ah, now there's the rub. <coughs> Everything being isotropic is very unusual. So it works great for liquids, it works good for metals, it works okay for ceramics. So the assumption of isotropy is a strong assumption. So, like I said, it works really good for liquids and for foams, but not for, not for very anisotropic things like ceramics. But again, the, it's, it's the whole idea of the same, ide the same ideas work even in these complex cases 
where things are not so isotropic, but it's not quite as beautiful of a result if everything's not isotropic. I can solve it, but it's work. It's not, and it's ugly. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, for the case of the fair bubbles, uh, you can see the reason that because of the diffusion of gas, that's why the the, the curvature will pull towards the center. Yes. But for the case of grain, uh, yes. What is the, the physical uh, explanation why the boundary will pull towards the? Yeah, excellent question. So let me see if I can go back. Hang on one second. Let me go back to so I can find the picture. Okay, so let's look at it like this. If I start, we, here's, the, here's one grain, here's the other grain. And imagine that I have atoms jumping back and forth at random. Since this one is curved more this way, I have more atoms that want to, let's see, I didn't say that right. Let's see, if something's curved very sharp, say like this, the energy is very high for things which are pointed because I've got a lot of broken bonds, right? So if I have something which is pointed like that, the number of broken bonds per area is much higher then if it's curved like that, I can, sorry, I need more hands. This is where a blackboard would help. <laughs> um, if I got the, if I've got all the atoms over here on this side, then there, the energy of this surface, the number of broken bonds when something's curved like this, and the materials on the outside, there's fewer broken bonds when it's curved like this than when it's curved the opposite. Direction. So here, if I have the material on the inside, I've got a lot of broken bonds per unit area. And then on this side, I've got fewer broken bonds per unit area. And so that's why it wants to go in that direction. If I drew, <laughs> if I had a blackboard, I could show you more easily. But it, it just has to do with the fact that a flat surface has a certain number of broken bonds. If it's curved one way, it's got more. If it's curved the opposite way, it has less. And that gives you the motion towards the center of curvature. Okay, if I had a blackboard I could prove it to you, but uh, you'll have to take my word for it now. <laughs> yeah, what, what the three dimensional part of this Yes. You have the 3D heat that's the beautiful form right there. Yes. If I clap all the surface area of the individual part of the crystal, so what's the time to bring here? Of the, to of the total? Yeah, total surface area of the... So the... Right, good question. So the air... So the linear, men the men uh, the linear measure of a grain size, so the average grain size measured linearly, will go like time to the one-half power. Uh, so that's the average. So on average. But each individual grain will evolve like that equation that I wrote down for you. So the linear grain size goes like time to the one half. And that's the mean, the average. If you say, what's the rate of change of the whole volume of the material? That never changes, because I have, only have so many atoms, and I'm not destroying atoms. But that's how big crystal eat the small crystal. That's the surface energy Yes, so, the, so, so if the average size goes like time to the one half, the rate at which things change go like time to the minus one half, and it goes slower and slower and slower because the energy is going down, 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 <laughs> down, down. Okay? Well, if there are no more questions, uh, let me. I just want to ask, Professor, what about the curvature of the Earth compared to this? I mean, you say that it's curvatures of the surface. What about the curvatures of the Earth's surface? I think it's got to do with this. 
so you're asking me how does the curvature of the the average curvature how does it evolve? Of the earth, earth, yeah, out of heat. Of the earth. Yeah. How does so if you if you take the earth and in, in, which is a which is to uh, topologically speaking as a sphere. And if I embedded that in some other medium, it, the atoms from the Earth would go off into this other medium, this is very speculative, would go off into the other medium, and the Earth would shrink such that the radius would decrease, like uh, the dr dt, the rate of change of the radius with respect to time, should go like time to the minus one half power. But that's not actually what happens, right? Because I'm not actually exchanging atoms between the Earth and some other solid across there with a certain surface tension. So, you know, what I answered was very, uh, you know, is if I had a spherical ball inside of a spherical grain inside of a, another single crystal, you would go like I just told you. But the Earth, you know, there's a different kinetics. Atoms don't want to jump off the Earth into the atmosphere at least not at an appreciable rate, so I think we're safe for a little while. <laughs> okay, so the idea, the idea I can apply, but I don't think in practice it's, uh, it's uh, directly applicable. I assume I'm interpreting your question right. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me present to Professor David Surovich <clears throat> on behalf of the Institute of Mathematics. Mathematical sciences, a uh, yeah. token of appreciation. This is a coffee map. Ah. I am so, uh, Thank you. Hope that you can. <laughs> so I, I heard that there's a famous quote that the definition of a mathematician is, right. is somebody who converts caffeine into theorems. That's right. So, so, so this, so will help this you. one helps. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.